at the end of my talk. Yeah, yeah please go. Right. So, okay. Next, I want to, I want to show you, uh, and we have introduced the all the, the PA fundamentals. I think and try to give you a summary of all the PA fundamentals from different pers uh, aspects. So next, I want to uh, present the multiple popular mini PA architectures and also design examples. Okay. So uh, uh, my group has been really working on the RF mini PAs in the past several years. This is actually the list of our um, the example PA designs. Right? The focus is, of course, on upper power, efficiency, and the linearity, and the finding a balanced solution that can deliver all these threes at the same time. Right? The, we, we look at the PA topologies. Right? The, the research in the, in the, in the, in the sibling based milieu PA really start roughly in the early 2000s. Uh, the, the basic class AB PAs since then and still till now are the mainstream PAs in most of the millimetry systems. So I'm showing some of the class AB PAs here as example designs. They offer good balanced performance because they offer good balanced performance in terms of uh, efficiency, linearity, and the modulated bandwidth. They are also this kind of called RF in, RF out PA with no need for any real-time controls and, uh, and, uh, and make the, the therefore they are, it's very compact and they are very easy to, um, to, to be absorbed into the system integrations. So as a result, class AB PAs are still serving as a workhorse PAs in many military and uh, communication or sensing applications. But right here is a really the, uh, a collection of examples here. To boost the efficiency beyond the basic class AB PAs, right, one approach, as I mentioned earlier, is to explore the harmonic contaminations. So there are many harmonic termination PAs, uh, and, uh, and the most of many of them, they are actually kind of narrow band. In the 2011, I think I believe Steve, uh, Professor Steve Cripps, their group then started this concept of the continuous mode harmonic tuning PAs, which have been widely used successfully for 3-5 compound PAs. It allows a certain phase shift and amplitude variation of the harmonics, but yet still achieve the, the broadband and the efficient PA operations. So another work and from uh, Virginia Tech and, and uh, in the past and actually present this uh, class F inverse and the class F exchange PAs at the ICC 2014, which is also a very interesting topology. So my group, we also look at this and uh, this, the, the, this topic, right? Our goal is different. We are trying to, uh, our goal is to substantially reduce the area of continuous mode harmonic tuning PA network at the PA output. Right. Instead of using a complex, complex network with many passive elements, we are trying to and, uh, and realize a broadband continuous mode in this example, uh, class F inverse of a matching network using only one on-chip transformer. The, the trick here, the idea here is to leverage and, and engineer the passive effects of the transformer so that it can, can achieve the, the desired harmonic level and terminations for the class F inverse operation. So the figure on the right essentially shows the, 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 the different harmonic terminations, and we can see, see that, yes, it achieved the wideband kind of class F inverse kind of implementation. And, uh, and, and the also, because it's a class F inverse, so the signal harmonic at the PA output is actually being emphasized. And we know that this will lead to poor PA and linearity if we don't do anything about it. So therefore, in this particular design, we also use the, the input signal harmonic short to kill the, the remixing, to suppress the remixing of the signal harmonic feedback and the waste the, the fundamental inputs, and then reduce the, the resulting IM3 components and improve the linearity of the PA. But the PA schematic and also the chip microphotograph are shown on the, on the left here. You can see that everything is being achieved at the output using only one transformer, but we are trying to leverage and emphasize its parasitics and of this transformer to achieve this class F inverse and uh, continuous mode tuning network. The work was published at the ICC and to the 2018. To further boost the PA large signal and the performance and achieve a very flat OP1DB and the PAE over a wide frequency range, my group we also look at the use of this on-chip coupler and uh, as a wideband power combiner. But this is one application of the on-chip coupler. And previously, we have seen that, yes, this is useful for very high frequency, but here is an example to show that it is also useful for around 20 to 40 gigahertz of applications. 
I will not go through the details here, but the, but the, 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 the resulting design is, it looks like a transformer, but is actually behaving not as a transformer. The reason that you can see that the trees, and we, when we model it using a coupler, the trees, we can allow the width to be very wide, to be 29 micron. If we model this as a transformer, we can see the self resonant frequency is only 27 gigahertz, and uh, certainly not useful for something like even 240 gigahertz because self resonant frequency is 27 gigahertz. And the, but we are in model, we model this as a, as a coupler balloon. We can essentially both utilize the magnetic coupling and also capacitor pack coupling from input to the output, and it actually behaves very well. And the, from and the 20 -ish gigahertz all the way to more than 40 gigahertz. And the resulting real and the imaginary part and is actually very stable, well behaved, and, uh, and the passive efficiency is also excellent. And uh, from 24 gigahertz to 42 gigahertz, over 80, 80, 86%. And uh, due to the wide and also large and, uh, and the turns of this, of this coupler. So we use it as an upper match network for a single branch differential PA from operating from 25 to 43 gigahertz. The chip area is also very compact and, uh, and uh, with only 0.21 millimeters square as the core area. And this is actually highly desired for large scale array applications. This work was published at ICC 2020. Okay, we actually further look at for this class AB like PAs. We will further look at how we can, we look at on the passive side, right? We also want to look at the active side. We want to see how we can further improve the device efficiency uh, and uh, itself for the PAs. And then basically as one of the designs, we come up with this class called so-called class W or dual drive PAs. So essentially, and uh, if we look at all the classic PA theory and uh, all the classic PA designs, they are using the transistor as a two terminal device. For example, we drive them at the gate and uh, ground the source and then we look at the output from the drain, right? That's it. And this two terminal assumption is essentially the basis for almost all the classic P analysis if we look at the P design books. And the, which then we can set the, 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 then we can, based on which we can define all the P classes and waveforms like class A, class B, class AB, which then will set all the limitations of the P efficiency, right? So and in addition, we can see that a factor of one minus knee voltage divided by VDD we know uh, presented earlier is due to, is, is actually another limiting factor on the efficiency and uh, and uh, due to the finite knee voltage. Okay, the, the uh, we we'll look at how we can break this limitation, right? So basically, one approach is to operate the device as a true three terminal device in the sense that we drive the gate and the source together, but in the opposite phase in this example. Right? In this case, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, when the PA drain voltage is low. And the source is, can also swing low. And this allows the drain voltage to go down even further. This will reduce the trial to operation of PA and will present an effective, much lower PA knee voltage. And then, as a result, improve the PA drain efficiency. The a PA was actually demonstrated in global foundry 45 nanometer CMOS process over the 23 to 4, 34 gigahertz and was presented in ICC 2021. And the, the resulting PA is quite a wide band with good efficiency and the linearity. And by using this class W and the dual drive on the of operation to improve the device performance intrinsically by itself. But you know, as a, at the same time, and uh, and we should also we also should not overlook the limitations of this topology, right? So the major issue here I want to point out is that since we are driving the gate and source together, the total PA input impedance if we lump them together is that will actually drop substantially. This lowers the device power gain. As a result, and uh, the, 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 despite the PA has very high gain and the drain efficiency, the actual achievable PA will be more limited, right? And, uh, and uh, also uh, the lower power gain also means that we will require uh, and, uh, uh, and the more stages of the PA or will require higher mixer or driver of power and both of which will consume more power and the DC power. Uh, of course, this will be particularly problematic since we know devices do not have a lot of gain for higher frequency. So this will be problematic for high frequency PA designs, right? So as an apple to apple comparison, and, uh, and uh, we look at the common source PA versus a class W dual drive PA at 28 gigahertz using global foundry 45 nanometer CMOS SOI process. Uh, it is, it's shown here on the right. 
So uh, this is only the peer device core simulation, right? With the, all the passes to be lossless so that we can have really the true apple to apple comparison. The dash line here are representing the, the common source PA performance and the solid lines are for the class W to a dry PAs. We can see that the power gain drops from 16 dB at the device level to 8.5 dB by using door drive, about 7.5 dB gain drop. And um, this may be okay for lower frequency, but as I mentioned, go to high and higher frequency, this will be problematic. So as a result, although you can see that the, and the dual drive class W has a better drain efficiency and a remarkably better and compared to common source, but and uh, the improvement in uh, actual PAE will be smaller due to, again, the limit of the gain, the, 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 the gain job. Well, we may say that what about cascode? Because cascode has higher gain to start with, maybe we are more tolerant, maybe we are more robust and we can tolerate more gain job, right? So we also perform an apple to apple comparison of cascode PA versus the class W dual drive PA at 20 gigahertz and the using global foundry 45 nanometer CMOS SOI process. Uh, shown on the on the right on this slides again, and uh, and the, the 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 simulation here only use a PA device core with losses passive networks, so the dash line for the common source, and uh, so the, the sorry the dash line for the cast code and the, the solid line for the class W cast code, and we can see that the power gain also drops from 20 20 dB um, gain to 12 point uh, about 12.3 dB of gain also another like ADB gain job. So in this case, the drain efficiency, and, the, and also in this case, the drain efficiency is less, is actually even smaller for the class W and the dual drive PA. Why? Because the cascode now has higher supply voltage, right? And if we reduce the effective knee voltage, the effect is less significant because the, the overall supply voltage is higher. So anyhow, the improvement on the actual PAE, we can see is also smaller and uh, for the bare device and the performance. If we add the input, the output passive loss, and uh, <coughs> the difference will also be even smaller. So therefore, I believe there's still a lot of room for exploration and improvement here for this type of uh, and, uh, and, uh, PA topologies. To further boost the output power at the millimeter with silicon PAs and um, the, the stacked transistor PA topology is also is being proposed and also demonstrated. The key here to, is re, really to leverage different feedback, feedboard, feed forward, or even direct driving networks so that we can allow the, the device gates of the stack device to swing and uh, <coughs> in synchrony with other with all the, and the drain voltages. This will reduce the stress of the cascade uh, uh, stacked devices and allow more device to be stacked beyond the conventional cascode PA and so that we allow the higher output power and the less impedance transformation, right? So as a result, the stacked PA will have uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, the, the uh, uh, relatively large optimal load and uh, so synch really simplified the output matching network um, can achieve a higher output power and a higher PAE. And uh, in addition, the, the stacked PA will also improve the power density of the silica devices by typically a factor of two or three, depending on how many devices we put in, in stack and how efficient the stack design is. But this potentially allows more compact integration of high power PAs, as we mentioned earlier, why it's so important. So here are a few examples of stacked transistor PAs and uh, millimeter PAs that can achieve excellent performance. We are, uh, from my group, we actually took a different approach uh, and we look at the, the, and the, what's the more efficient way to do power combining, right? So, and the, that will be a parallel approach to the stacked PA, which essentially means can be combined together with stacked PA to achieve further better performance. So uh, we explore this cascaded asymmetric coupler valent designs for the series power combining to achieve over one watt of power at 60 gigahertz using 45 nanometer CMOS process. So cascading this uh, asymmetric power combiner will really ensure that the, that the same uh, uh, optimal load for each branch and also ensure the in-phase series power combining of each PA branches at the final output. So overall, we are able to achieve and, uh, the power combining efficiently of 24 PAs together into the same output. The work was presented at ICC 2019. So, <clears throat> 
And uh, there was a lot of discussions about backup efficiency, as we just uh, mentioned earlier, and through the previous Q&As. So when we are talking about the backup efficiency, we know we should we really should talk about the Doherty PA design and also, also and also the upper facing uh, PA design. Here's a list of millimeter Doherty or Doherty light PA from different research groups. This is a list of the millimeter wave out facing PAs from different research groups. <clears throat> My group also has been working on this Doherty or Doherty light PA designs in, in, in silicon. And as an example, uh, and uh, uh, a popular design. And from my group is this and uh, our world first millimeter wave Doherty PA in 130 nanometer CG and uh, technology we demonstrated first and which can cover uh, multiple 5G bands at 28 gigahertz, 37 gigahertz, and also 39 gigahertz that can be used for compact MIMO applications and provide backup efficiency enhancement and uh, at these bands. The, the work was published at ICC 2017 and also extend to GSC in 2019. So we further investigate the possibility to achieve higher power millimeter Doherty PAs. Right here, we explore this Doherty passive network based on the transformer impedance inverter and, and the capacity and the impedance inverter and the networks, right? Combination of the two. So overall, the design achieved the 24 to 30 gigahertz and the linear Doherty PA with almost watt level of power uh, at the and, uh, and, uh, and the four and CMOS and uh, I think for a C, uh, 130 nanometer CD by CMOS implementation, the output network combines and the four differential PAs uh, as the main and the PA and the four differential PAs and auxiliary PA combined together, and uh, the work was presented at ICC in the 2020. Okay, so we also look at okay how we can what's the best way to extend this Doherty performance PA to higher frequency for example 60 gigahertz right so and we leveraged our previous understanding and the discovery of the behavior for those coupler based balance as I mentioned earlier the way we can design them for different input to output phases will make the couplers as impedance inverting balance and impedance scaling balance. So therefore, we purposely design a balun as impedance inverting balun, and uh, essentially it does the balun operation, but also as an impedance inverter as well. And we design not, not a network as the impedance scaling balun. If we combine the two together and uh, drive the two balun separately with uh, main PA and auxiliary PA, and uh, all together we'll have a Doherty PA. And the, the, here is the load simulated results, and then and the, and the, indeed this actually achieves a very nice and uh, Doherty be behavior at 60 gigahertz. The work was published at uh, in the RFSC 2019 and also GSCC in uh, 2020, leveraging coupler-based Doherty and uh, impedance inverting, impedance scaling networks. Okay, so, uh, sorry, give me one second for the, Oops, I'm sorry. Let me give me one second of the, let me flip to the right side. So, okay. So the, in recent years, and the Professor Steve Cripps group, group, they also proposed this very popular called a load modulated balanced amplifier, LMBA, right? So the LMBA use a 90 degree coupler at the output and uh, feeding the two quadrant ports using two main PAs and the isolation port and uh, using uh, and, uh, and the control amplifier or uh, of essentially a PK amplifier or auxiliary PAs, we can call it. So if we assume that the uh, open network is driven by the current sources by solving the current to voltage relationship, we can see that and that the load of the two main PAs will be modulated by the current of the, and the control amplifier to achieve a backup efficient enhancement. The unique advantage here is that it can support a very wide band active load modulation only limited by the 90 degree coupler. This is why this LMBA topology is becoming very popular in both 3 5 compound devices and also silicon and the, 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 the and the, and the PA and the world. But however, it has also has its limitations. First of all, it is kind of restricted to single end PAs and uh, because of the coupler designs, or it will require additional balance or differential quadrant couplers. Also, both of them will limit the bandwidth and, uh, and uh, introduce additional loss. So moreover, the main and the control amplifiers will actually do not have equal power and uh, so as a result, it will have additional three to four dB of gain compression and uh, in theory. So finally, and also for the output, the, for the quadrant couplers and uh, with in the, in the 
desired and uh, coupling factors, especially at other frequencies, it is possible for, the, for some of the PA to see negative load and uh, impedance during the load modulation. So, um, well, different from the LMBA, and the, my group, we actually proposed this coupler balance and using the coupler balance as the upper load modulation network. It is actually a combination of two, um, two couplers. So if we drive the, the, the port one, and this is a couple of billion, if we drive the port one using the differential main amplifier and the drive the port two with the auxiliary amplifier and the terminal port three and the, with the antenna load, we can actually see that the main PA's load impedance is exactly modulated by the auxiliary PA and the current. So uh, and the, we, this is actually guaranteed by this equation. So, and, uh, and we can see that the, 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 the use of port of the couplers and the can be terminated, the unused port, by the way, can be terminated by and the AC and the short, which naturally will provide the supply and the, and the, and the feeding for the, for the differential and the main PA, right? So interestingly, our work and the Professor Steve Cripps LMBA work will show that both 90 degree coupler, quadruple coupler, and the 180 degree valent coupler can be, perform Authority like active load modulation. That's very interesting. These two circuits probably like dualities. But however, our coupler based the Balen and the Doherty PA has the following advantages. First of all, it allows the, the broadband active load modulation is only limited by the coupler Balen, so potentially it can be very wide, wide band. And the, moreover, it supports differential PA operation so that the PA can use capacity neutralization to enhance the gain and the, and, and the, and the, and the and the isolation over a wide bandwidth, that's also another advantage. And the using differential PA, it is insensitive to the ground and the supply inductances, right? And also the main auxiliary PA here can have equal power. So therefore this ensures the no theoretical gain compression for 6 dB power backoff and, uh, and, uh, and the operation. So we first report this topology and its operation in the, uh, in the ICC 2021, and then it's followed by another paper at IMS in the 2021. So, then we actually placed the impedance inverting and, uh, and uh, basically we placed this topology uh, with two balance, then we can have uh, main PA and auxiliary PA. We also show that by exchanging their roles, we actually have, uh, we can further broaden the performance. Uh, this is the design and, uh, and the multiple design we have shown here. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and in, this, uh, in this silicon platform, and we are able to show that we can cover, uh, I think, uh, from uh, the, uh, uh, I think it, it shows up from like 25 gigahertz and the, all the way to almost 60 gigahertz operation with different level of backup efficiency enhancement by using this and the, um, the continuous mode copper balance topology together with main auxiliary low exchange. It also achieves a very wide band and the modulation and uh, support wide band modulation as well. So this is the advantage of this design. And we further extend this work, and I'm not showing here, to Indian phosphide designs that shows that, okay, we can use this technique to cover from almost 30 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz, achieving almost three to one of bandwidth for active load modulation. So that is also and essentially set another world record in this uh, and the type of PAs. Okay, so uh, and, uh, we are talking about, the, we talk about the broadband PA performance, and here we are talking about, okay, how we can actually perform better Doherty performance. I think we probably don't have a lot of time to discuss the details here. Essentially, we are using and, uh, and the mixing of Doherty topology, which is a combination of the main PA as an analog PA and auxiliary PA as a digital PA. And uh, then we can have both optimum control and the super resolution capabilities. And uh, by using and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, basically the, the, the mixing signal and the analog plus the Doherty and the uh, analog plus the, and the digital combinations of the PAs. So the design was presented at the ICC 2019 and the GSCC in the 2019. I will not go through the details here, but if you're interested, you can take a look of this, of this PA. It achieved a really nice, you can see very nice authority behavior and set the record of um, and the, and the modulation based efficiency. It achieves the average efficiency in the modulation with wideband modulation of 27.8%. Yeah. Okay, so Further, and uh, when we place the, 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 the distorted PAs and or when we place the PAs in our practical transmitter arrays, we know that because of the unwanted coupling between the elements, 
the each PA will actually see different loads, and uh, especially when we are having uh, the beam steering. And the loads and the variations will be also beam dependent, right? So the typical load variations can be as large as two to one to three to one VSWR in practice. So the following two articles are really and, uh, and, uh, and have a nice summary about this topic if you want to learn more details about this antenna, this is called antenna load variation, which is a particular problem in a large array. So what is a typical two to one antenna VSWR? If we assume the mismatched antenna impedance is real, for simplicity, therefore it can be as low as 25 ohm or as high as 100 ohms. So, of course, it will substantially change the PA performance and both in terms of the, the efficiency, upper power, and also its linearity. So, therefore, the challenge here is that how to keep the PA performance even under the antenna VSWR when it is being implemented in a large array. So, we work on this, we work in this space, there are different type of designs reported already, but we work in this space by leveraging the, and the Doherty PA, as well as um, and, uh, and using AI control to improve the Doherty performance over VSWR. The work was published at the GOMAC Tech and the 2019 conference, and uh, also IMC 5G and 2019, and also, uh, and, uh, and also a TCAS 1 paper in 2020, and uh, showing the, how we can use uh, AI machine learning and, uh, and uh, to do uh, rapid and smart control authority when there is antenna load variations. Well, we still can improve the, ensure the, the compression and the linearity and also efficient performance of authority. At the same time, as another new direction of the PA designs, and uh, I think this is probably even gen can be generalized for military RF designs, we are using and uh, we are actually exploring using machine learning techniques to help us to do quick and the direct synthesis of different on-chip EM structures that can be used and coupled with active devices to, uh, uh, and, uh, to achieve and, uh, and the rapid prototyping of RF millimeter circuits. Again, I don't have a lot of time to talk about details here, uh, but the goal is really to ultimately achieve this uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the faster prototyping and the faster design iterations using machine learning techniques. Yeah. And the further, uh, the PA and the, and the if we look at the power amplifiers and also in, in the larger scope transmitter designs and uh, there's this interesting applications for uh, and the latency and uh, and the, and, the, and the security applications and also high throughput. So we are also leveraging a trans different type of transmitting transmitter MIMOs and to, to achieve physical layer security. So these are actually two. And uh, just one example of that, and we published the work at RFIC 2021 and the GSCC and the 2022, and that will be, as accepted, will be, pub will be public, published online very soon. So this is, I just, here I just want to show you one example of the extension of uh, PA and, uh, and the transmitter and the research as the system level, the, what we can do, what we can achieve. Yeah. All right. So I think that is kind of concludes my, uh, the section on the PA architecture and also designs, I think, and uh, uh, maybe I can, due to the interest of time, maybe I should just directly go to the next, uh, the, the last section and conclude my talk. And uh, if, we, if there are any questions, we can and do the Q&A and in the end. Yeah, that will work, Professor. I think uh, that's a good idea. Yeah, okay. So next, I want to give a very because of, uh, the brief summary about this antenna PA code design examples, right? I want to focus on the principles and uh, to show you why this is important, why this is interesting. So the conventional millimeter wave and, uh, and, uh, and the microwave circuits designs are really designed with uh, and the systems with design very uh, separate level of abstractions for devices, EM structures and the circuits and the antennas in, in particular, Right, the circuit typically circuit designer we design the circuits and the antenna designer will design the antenna, and we only talk to each other through a standard 50 ohm interface. Right, and uh, and uh, uh, we also try to always try to avoid EM coupling as much as possible. Right, and however, the modern technology is offering a lot of versatile backend uh, backend models, as well also as well as essentially unlimited the cost of the devices. So the question here is that. Can we actually take a different and a holistic approach by breaking the boundaries and explore the code designs of devices, circuits, and EM structures altogether? For example, 
because devices are so fast right now and they can be well controlled and they can provide a wide variety of excitations and terminations and they can collectively synthesize and essentially any EM structures and in the near field and permitted by the Maxwell equations. So this really potentially can lead to a desired far field relations and which will, and, uh, and, and, uh, but with a different level of reconfigurability and different level of controls. So I believe this one of the paradigm shift is really to breaking to break the conceptual boundaries and uh, and uh, and uh, and among the devices circuits EM structures and really to look at the holistic design and the device designs. And I think this is the one very interesting approach so that we can push the performance beyond what can be achieved at this moment, right? To, to, to make the best and the clever use of them, right? Since we have been showing on the, on, the, on, the, on the ETH background and also have some connection with ETH. So I have to have one slide with Albert Einstein, right? So this is just for fun. So I believe this support from Einstein is particularly relevant here. So essentially, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. So that's the basic last the quote. So therefore, if, if we want to push the performance to the next level, we want to push the innovation to the next level, we need to explore the next level and we will need to bring the knowledge and know-how from other fields right, to, to enable the innovations. And with this new level of degree of freedom, we can explore and also new level of dimensions we can explore for new and, uh, innovations. So I believe the antenna electronic co-design exactly matches this research philosophy, right? So after merging the circuits with the antenna design, we can create some kind of new hybrid uh, and uh, antenna electronics with versatile on radiator and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, basically functionalities. It's not only in the radiator, and also it can serve as a signal combining, splitting, and filtering. And the antenna itself can perform impedance scaling and the uh, voltage to current and, uh, and the amplifications and the, as a, in a passive way. And also it can achieve active load modulation and, and, the, some, and the, for certain designs, we can, I can also show you that they can achieve noise cancellation and a different level of reconfigurability as well. So my group has been working on this topic for the past uh, and eight years in many, in many designs. I will walk through the, these of some of the designs to show you the, the new on antenna and the functionalities demonstrated by the designs, right? So for example, to boost the upper power, and uh, we can use power combining techniques and the conventional power te combining techniques is to use uh, on-chip or on-package passive uh, network to sum the power from multiple devices and deliver them to the same antenna, right? However, such passive combiners are always lossy and they will degrade the efficiency, particularly when we need to sum many um, power devices all together. That's the problem. And uh, of course, another approach is to use a spatial power combining and by large antenna arrays. And this method can achieve very almost lossless power combining in the far field as long as we have perfect beamforming and with additional another 10 log n antenna gain to enhance the ERP. Uh, however, as we mentioned earlier, it requires large antenna panel size and uh, it also without a narrow beam width. And uh, for example, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a, a, a half, wavelength, half wavelength dipole will have half power beam width of 78 degrees by itself. But once we have 16 element array, the beam width will reduce to only 60 degrees. So that's a, and this, uh, this such a narrow beam width will really complicate the TX RX alignment in reality, especially in dynamic and mobile environments. So, and, uh, and uh, uh, these two approaches are essentially the results of the conventional constraints that circuits can only interface with one uh, with antenna using the standard and uh, one port and uh, for example, 50 ohm interface. But if we break the constraint, as I mentioned earlier, we will find a lot of new innovation opportunities right in front of us. Right in front of us. For example, an in innovation example is to have this multi-feed antenna structure that can be driven by multiple electronic amplifiers in half wavelength. For example, if we use a half wavelength lambda and, uh, and uh, the, the dipole as an example, we can play with the and the output current of the amplifiers, we can make multiple ports with different current excitation so that and the, the total and the, and, the, and the current on this antenna profile and uh, current profile is the same as the current profile on single feed antenna, then they, therefore they will achieve the same far field pattern. 
right? So and uh, and, uh, and and but now it is in addition to the radiation, it also achieves the power combining on the antenna itself. So this simplifies the and the, it can be shown that the load of the and the, and the amplifiers moreover uh, will be smaller than the the load of a single single and the antenna feed antenna. And overall, it's being achieved within the same and just one antenna footprint, right? This simplifies the and the transformation and the, and the increase the efficiency and still keep everything very compact. Of course, we can use them as multiple uh, elements and to an, as an array and to further enhance the output power. So I think this is a good example of this hybrid antenna electron cone design to achieve the power combining. Right, using this and uh, the, this principle, I will show you some design later on. But uh, to help the circuit community better understand the hybrid antenna electronics co design concept, I think my group actually and uh, came up with the equivalent circuit modeling and analysis framework for these different multi feed antennas. And uh, we have it can be shown that the on antenna series power combiners and dividers can be achieved using and uh, multiple. Uh, and, uh, and using a multi feeds and uh, and uh, and uh, basically multiple feeds on a wire or loop antennas, and due to their current continuity, or we can use the multiple and the near field coupled slot antennas to achieve this serial power combining. And uh, and uh, we can also and as a duality, the on antenna parallel power combining can be achieved using multiple parallel feeds on the on the slot type antenna, or we can use multiple near field coupled wire or loop antenna also achieving equivalent power, power combining, right? So, and uh, moreover, multi-feed antennas can also behave as on antenna and the transformers, and, uh, and uh, that, can, uh, that can change the driving impedance or scale the, the current voltage among each feed, and just like a transformer, right? So in summary, besides the radiation, the antenna is now be behaving as an import non-isolating passive networks. And uh, and uh, so these properties essentially really establish the foundations of this um, and uh, antenna electronic school design and can help us intuitively explain that the coupling among these ports and uh, and uh, guide our designs and all together. So going back to the power combining case, and uh, we use this uh, the property of this uh, on antenna power combining, and uh, we combine the sixteen power amplifiers and driving the same four feed on chip slot antenna. And uh, the, each PA is composed of two stage cascode PA, and uh, and then all the 16 power amplifiers are combined together on the same antenna. And the, the radiator was implemented at 60 gigahertz and using global foundry 45 S, uh, nanometer CMOS SOI process, and um, it's pre chip packaged. And uh, the total chip and achieves the basically 28 dBm upper power and uh, 33.1 dBm ERP uh, at 59 gigahertz using only one antenna and one transmitter and a cell. So this is setting a, and a, and a, a world record at that time. The efficiency is also uh, pretty high at 23.4% and uh, among the highest and also support very, very wide band modulation as well without any digital pre-distortion. So we also look at how we can actually further in the, 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 the problem and the explore the property of, the, of, of this antenna, uh, on antenna kind of network. If we can use them as a passive network for power combining, we can potentially use them for active load modulation as well. So this is the, our follow-up research. And we were able to explore them and for on antenna doorly power combining. And, uh, and so the, the entire structure is, is not only uh, and, uh, and the radiator, linear radiator, it also achieves the antenna series and, uh, and the power combining and the doorly operation to enhance the back of efficiency. Right? The work was published at the ISC 2018 and the GSC in 2018. Right? Here is a summary of the performance. You can see that at around, I believe, that the 62 to 68 gigahertz, about 63 gigahertz, we achieve uh, 1.52 times back of efficient enhancement at 60, at 60 dB PBO compared to class BPA. This is the state of the art and the, of the back of efficient enhancement. Uh, it also supports very high speed modulation and uh, it, the, the modulation is undistorted over a wide, wide field of view because and the, everything is combined on the antenna and read it out. That's why it's insensitive to the field of view. Uh, the, the work can be further extended to high order authority on the antenna. It was published later on at the ISC and uh, 2019. Okay, similar principle is being, uh, we, we, we took the similar principle 
achieve the on antenna actually and the out facing transmitters right so some the uh, one example design is shown here was published at the RFIC to the 18 and the GSCD to the to the 19. So this achieves and uh, you can see the substantial back of efficiency enhancement for uh, on the out facing mode at uh, 28 gigahertz. And in this case, we actually use on the, the board on the on package antenna to achieve this on the out facing performance. Again, it supports wideband modulation as well, right? So some further study. And by leveraging the, the antenna and the, uh, the multi-feed antenna properties, and because it can behave as a transformer, it can behave as an impedance scaling network, it can behave as a, and a passive voltage and current scaling network. We actually use them and uh, combine them together with L and the millimeter wave and the LNAs and together achieve our antenna noise cancellation and also our antenna and the gain boosting for the for the low noise amplifiers as a, as a receiver by using two very closely coupled and uh, and and, uh, and the on chip antennas right this is operating at the 80 gigahertz so uh, i will not talk about, uh, i will not cover the details here but the, the work was published at ICC in 2020 and also GSCC 2020 so it shows that the measured noise figure of 5.5 to 4.5 dB that is the state of the art and for CMOS receiver at this frequency, it also achieved pretty and high actually linearity. It also supports wideband and 64 quam and uh, signal without using any digital pre-distortion. So we further and uh, 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 explore the uh, and then antenna electronics co-design, right? So not only for power combining, load modulation, we can we also explore the isolation natural isolation of different ports on the antenna and uh, by exploring that then we can achieve <clears throat> actually polarization based on the duplex trx using the same on chip antenna shown here and using the same actually four feet drive and uh, and the loop and and, and, and antenna uh, on chip so uh, the orthogonal pairs are essentially naturally isolated from each other um, due to the isolation and the polarization isolation, so uh, th this was actually leveraged and, uh, and uh, for uh, to achieve a 60 gigahertz full duplex TRX, and uh, we demonstrated in a 45 CMOS SOI process, and we can show that actually the chip to chip communication. This is actually the the the, the world first chip to chip polarization based duplexing and communication with gigabit per second of uh, 64 quam on the modulation. Right. This again, this is achieved without using any digital pre distortion. And the channel equalization, or and also no digital and the cancellation at the back end. Right. Uh, similarly, the the the, the, the antenna electronic core design can be further explored at the even higher frequency. So here we achieve, we use this for the um, this technique for power combining and uh, to achieve and uh, uh, at the 340 gigahertz and invisible sensor nodes, uh, and, and basically that can be used for. Uh, massive uh, sensor network and uh, micro robots and subdermal implants and so on and so forth applications. Right. So I think and the these are is really the different examples about how we can uh, leverage antenna and, and, and the circuits co-design to achieve new functionalities. Right. So I think with that and uh, this concludes my and the uh, and the presentation. So and uh, in summary and uh, and uh, there is plenty of space for research and innovations in the field of RF and the millimeter PAs and the transmitters and the power generations. So I, I believe that the key is really come up with designs that can offer balanced trade-offs among all the uh, different performance metrics, including carrier bandwidth, efficiency, linearity, and the modulation rate. So we have presented in this uh, talk. Uh, PA design fundamentals. We also work through a wide variety of uh, design architectures and the design examples. Um, and um, I think in particular, I think is which is very interesting that we show that a four port Balen uh, coupler can be used for wideband authority operation, just like the 90 degree and the coupler in the LMBA. That's a very interesting example. So, but our, the, the, our Balen based the coupler based authority PA can address um, different limitations of the LMBA. Right. So finally, we also introduced it and also present this antenna PA co-design and antenna electronics coding in general um, at the minimum frequency. So this is the end of my talk. So I uh, apologize for this long presentation and, uh, and uh, together with uh, the Q&A session in the middle, 
but uh, thank you for attending my talk. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Professor Huang. It's uh, quite an interesting topic. As you can see, there is a huge interest from the audience. And thank you once again from, from uh, on behalf of our MTT SCB uh, Silicon Valley San Francisco chapter. Thank you so much. And we will take one more shot at the questions. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, please use the uh, raise hand button. Okay, uh, I'm going to unmute I Ching Li. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. I, I have a question that, uh, what do you think of the design automation of uh, analog or RF circuit design as you introduced in your presentation with AI? And, and what to, extent, uh, to what extent um, do you think might it replace human engineer in industry? And that's my question. Oh, uh, uh, that's actually a very good question. We are also often asking ourselves. So I would like to say that what we are doing now is just only scratching the surface. So um, and, uh, I can certainly see that for the given topologies, if we use this, uh, we, we use these tools for design optimizations or helping us to come up with, um, you know, essentially to provide expert knowledge, the so-called design intuitions and by using machine learning network for our fixed topology and uh, network of circuits, this is totally feasible. And uh, we can have a rapid initial in the, in the, in the, we can arrive at the initial design and uh, very rapidly and uh, for the synthesis. And uh, do we have the general AI to, to, that can come up with new circuit topologies? And that is a much bigger question to ask, right? So I don't think I have an answer for that. It's a much more difficult the, 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 the problem, right? And, but I think, as I mentioned, for standardized topologies, and, uh, and the, we can use these techniques, I think I can certainly see that in the future, and the AI machine learning tools will help us uh, come up with, and uh, quickly come up with the initial designs and or help us optimize designs. I think it will it will happen. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question, Yulong, Zhao. And the, by the way, I also want to add one more thing, right? So I think these tools will also help us to even port the designs from one generation of the nodes to the next generation of the nodes. So that is also very, I mean, uh, viable and application too. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Professor Wang, this is uh, Yulong again. And uh, in terms of uh, the antenna and the PA code design, I have two questions on that. The first sure. one is, uh, I mean, inherently the, the antenna is usually a resonant circuit, so it's kind of narrow bandwidth. So do you think it is possible to design like a uh, uh, wide band, uh, um, uh, low modulated uh, PA based on the antenna coupling? Uh, that's one question. And the second question is that uh, usually the antenna is quite sensitive to the environment, which uh, provides a boundary condition, right? So I think it may be a kind of sensitive to, to, to the environment or some mismatch happens uh, in the environment for the antenna P co-design systems. So do you think it is kind of uh, a good area to do some research on, for example, if there are some mismatch or other things happens, how to characterize and uh, character, uh, correct the performance of the, the uh, door DPA or shriek sure. or something. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, uh, that, uh, very good questions, right? So I think, first of all, to answer your bandwidth question, I think it's in many cases, honestly, indeed it's limited by the antenna. But it, uh, that actually per se has nothing to do with antenna electronics co-design. It's more like antenna behavior itself. So therefore it will be more promising if we start with something like broadband antenna. And then we are trying to figure out the parallel or series and the, and the relationship of the antenna, right? Basically we want to find the circuit dualities or circuit equivalence of the multi feeds on that antenna. And then start with that antenna as the baseline design and you can have broader bandwidth design, number one. Number two, the antenna electronics code that actually will give you more degree of freedoms because we can have, as I said, many active devices terminations. So it provides certain level of reconfigurability 
which if you leverage can potentially broaden your bandwidth, right? Because it can essentially, uh, to some extent, change the shape of the radiator itself. And of course, that is itself is a frequency reconfigurability and, uh, and by its nature, right? The, to answer your signal question, essentially, oh yeah, regarding the mismatch on the antenna, I think there are different type of mismatches or non identities we want to talk about here. For some of the mismatches, again, active device reconfigurability will help us to solve the, to kind of address some of the, to mitigate, compensate for some of the mismatches, that's good. But I think we also need to talk about a bigger problem and it's kind of elephant in the, in the room that in many on-chip uh, antennas, uh, you know, honestly, the, the biggest problem is the substrate mode or surface or surface wave, and uh, however we call it, in the sense that the wave will propagate due to the higher dielectric constant or the thickness of the dielectric constant, the wave will propagate in the, in the, in the substrate, and that will actually make the antenna even behavior even more sensitive. And uh, in many cases, the wave probably in the substrate and the getting reflected from the boundary of the chip and then read it out, messed up your desired and the radiation. Or come back to alter the, 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 the performance of the radiator. So in that case, then I think this goes back to the old classic question about how we can suppress the substrate modes. And uh, the answer is that there are different ways of doing that, right? I think all of them, and also maybe we can come up with new ways to suppress the suffering modes, but all of them will help us to further in, in enhance the robustness of on-chip antennas in general and antenna electronics for design in particular. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Professor. And next, uh, Amit Mishra. Um, hi, Professor. Thanks for your excellent presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Um, sure. So one is more generic about, uh, so in the six, in sub six gigahertz re regime, I have seen more kind of switching a power amplifier such as class E or class D in work power amplifiers. So till what frequency can these switching power amplifier be pushed uh, before they give way to the linear amplifier design? Um, my, my second question is about the class W amplifier. Uh, so in, in class W amplifier, I see that the source was actually uh, fluctuating and that would lead, I, I presume that might lead to VTH variation. Uh, would that lead to more AM to AM distortion issues? Thank you. Okay, so that's, a, that's a, and, uh, okay. So I think you have two questions. So uh, first of all, about uh, uh, the, how high the frequency kind of we can push and, uh, and so that we can still have a PA uh, uh, for higher frequency, right? I think I kind of answered this question in the previous Q and A's, and the, and the common practice is to 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 go around, let's say, up to one third of the F max. So if the device technology, let's say, give you F max of 450 gigahertz, then we are looking at up to 150 gigahertz, and we can still design something with a reasonable gain and uh, and the efficiency, ideally, right? But of course. The lower frequency we go, and typically you have better gain and you have better performance of the of the PA, and and you and the, the, the additional gain also give you more de design degree of freedom. As you mentioned, we can do maybe switching PAs. We can do, uh, we can emphasize. We now we have the budget to emphasize on the harmonics, or we have the the, the budget to bias the, the the device even lower to achieve and a higher efficiency and uh, and uh, and uh, have a better trade off with the linearity. So that is uh, basically my answer. Typically, one third of our F max. That's a common practice. Uh, going to a signal question regarding the class WPA, um, the, the actually the, the due to the very fact that we are swinging the, the, the source, this actually uh, to some extent enhances the linearity because you can imagine that right. And the, when the uh, depending on the phase of the source voltage swing, if it's if, if it is swinging and uh, in opposite to the gate swing, then ideally when your drain voltage is low, the source voltage is low as well. This, uh, this kind of reduced the, the period of time when the device is operating a trial. This improves the, actually the, the linearity. So as a result, you can see, we can see that at the device level simulation and we can achieve a higher and, uh, and a kind of OP1DB and uh, for the same device and a slightly higher OP1DB due to the exactly same this effect. Yeah, but of course, I also want to mention that this is 
happening at the expense of door power gain. Yeah. Okay, so this will be the last question for the for the presentation. So Ali, please go ahead. Um, hi, Professor Wang. Thank you for your presentation. So I have a question about the Dory operation regarding the load book contours. So in some cases, um, the efficiency contour and the output part contour uh, can be very similar on the Smith chart. So I don't think it is very good situation for the Dory operations. So how do you uh, implement the the Dory operation in this kind of um, the, the this kind of the load pool contour situation? Okay, so uh, the uh, the load pool contour situation. So we, um, I think this this has a lot to do with the specific devices and also the frequency you're operating at. Right, so when the device and the, and the basically the, and also device output in large signal output impedance in particular. So, um, uh, yeah, I think this, the, it, it, it's a little bit hard to say. So typically, and uh, when, we, when we design the Doherty for uh, the PAs and with the local control, and uh, we, we first need to look at what is the optimum load for the, for the main PA when doing the power backup. And the, what is the optimum load with the main PA and auxiliary PA together at the maximum of power, right? And that may not be exactly uh, half of the value because you know there are a lot of non idealities. And also, I'm sure, and the, and the, I'm sure you know that in reality, and we often design asymmetric authorities, right? The main auxiliary may not be symmetric, so all these things need to be uh, and determined separately. And the, eventually, the network need to be co-optimized to hit the and uh, and the optimal impedance at different power levels. So that's uh, yeah, that that is actually more involved in optimization, I would say. Yeah, but the uh, one thing about the Doherty and the important thing is that uh, it's not only about the contours and uh, of the hitting the optimal load impedance. It's also about how we can ensure the correct turning on time of the auxiliary and uh, PAs so that we can achieve the both optimal back of the enhancement, but also the, and also the linearity. So therefore, often we need to design the, the, the IP devising to facilitate the rapid turning on of the auxiliary PAs. And also that the devising should be reconfigurable so that we can you know, really optimize the performance in value. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, once again, we are uh, we are happy and we are really pleased to have you do the uh, talk on the PA designs uh, on behalf of our chapter. We'd, we'd like to thank you so much, and I would like to hand off to Utkarsh for the closing remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Venkara. So I will switch uh, to my screen. I guess I have a few closing slides. And... Thank you. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we do. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you very much, Professor. This was a marathon session. I know it's very odd hours for you in Europe. So uh, probably enough here for two or even multiple talks. We'll probably end up splitting this in two multiple videos. Uh, so thank you very much. This was uh, one of the best talks we did. And I just wanted to uh, post the statistics. So of the 1143 people registered, we had 357 attend. This is more than twice our previous uh, peak. Uh, just goes to show the interest that folks have in this topic. And given all the questions and the very strong engagement, this probably makes sense to turn this uh, into a, a power amplifier series, you know, like given all the amazing work that you and others are doing in this field, I think there'll be a lot of interest to kind of uh, uh, make a series out of this. Uh, I don't know how, whether you'd be interested in participating in this uh, further, but we'll definitely love to uh, have you engage more if you're an interested professor. Absolutely, and uh, I'm happy to, and uh, you know, uh, the participate in the, in the, the, we can put together a, a series program on this topic, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, so, yeah, like I said, this was like a record, both in terms of registration and attendance. And uh, just wanna go on to the next slide here. Uh, okay, so just closing, I just wanna mention uh, congratulations again to the new officers who will be taking over. Uh, I'll continue to remain as an advisor 
uh, and probably we'll engage uh, with uh, uh, Professor Wang and others uh, and maybe turn this into a series because it seems like there's a lot of interest here. So uh, also, what I just want to mention, we have our YouTube channel up and running. So this talk was recorded. We'll be sending out the links to the video and the slides to all registrants. So in the next couple of days, you should be receiving an email from us with links to the video and we'll be including the links to the new YouTube channel where we have uh, everything kind of organized by year and topics. So uh, you'll be getting links to that. And of course, uh, please, uh, if you're not a member yet, consider joining the IEEE uh, and also the MTTS, the Microwave Theory and Technic Society uh, so that we can continue to bring you such amazing talks uh, uh, in, such, in, in so many different fields. And of course, our, on LinkedIn, you can follow us on hashtag MTTSCV, and we'll be including this membership uh, benefit information uh, in the email that we send out as well. So uh, so I'm very happy that uh, I'm able to hand off uh, things on such a high note. Uh, so wish you all uh, happy holidays and a safe and uh, prosperous new year ahead. And uh, uh, we'll, I guess we'll see you back here next year. So thanks again, Professor. Thank you, everybody. And uh, stay safe. Thank you. I also would like to thank the uh, Santa Clara the Valley chapter for organizing this uh, an excellent event. And I think this is um, and, uh, really fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for, for inviting me. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And also, I would like to thank the over 120 and the participants who are staying with us through this marathon talk and uh, all, yeah. all to the end. And I'm uh, <laughs> very impressed. And, uh, thank you for your interest. So, and uh, I, due to, again, <laughs> due to interest of time, and uh, I could not uh, address all the Q&As. And uh, so if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to me and, uh, and we can discuss uh, offline. Happy to follow up. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Happy holidays uh, to everyone. Yeah. And with that, we'll close our proceedings and uh, uh, happy new year and uh, uh, stay safe. And we'll see you back here next year. Bye. Yeah. Bye.